Hey there, I am Dr. Carrie Fullerton, and today I wanted to just share a little bit about how maybe we've changed our vocabulary, but we really haven't changed our practice as much, and how easy it is for us to fall into a space where we're dieting in disguise. So many times we start on some kind of plan and we think that we're doing it differently, but really, we're just dieting in disguise. This is really about how diet culture has been really sneaky and it's evolved in a way that has gone mostly unnoticed. We all agree that diets don't work. On this, I very, very rarely get anyone saying, no, they work great. Very rarely does that happen. Dieting fell out of fashion over the last decade, uh, Weight Watchers had one of their lowest enrollments ever, and they ended up changing their name and really rebranding the way that they're doing things. There's lots of different things out there. And even though it fell out of fashion and that we agree that diets don't work, we largely have not stopped dieting. We may call it a cleanse, we may call it a lifestyle, we can call it all kinds of different things. But at the end of the day, it's the same cycle. It's just different vocabulary. The cycle of restriction is really what dieting culture is built on. And we know we can throw in wellness culture too. But really what it comes down to is that at some point we get the sense that we need to take control it's time. This could be a health scare. It could be a health scare of a friend of ours, a family member. Uh, it could be that we just see that number on the scale that officially concerns us. Maybe we've tried on some clothes. Could be any kind of thing, but at some point we just have this moment of, I have to take control. And unfortunately, this means there's going to be some restriction. Now, the restriction might be the time of day that you're eating. The restriction could be caloric. The restriction could be a food group. It could be, oh no, I'm not restricting. I'm just not eating any processed sugars or refined grains or meat or insert whatever. There is some kind of restriction because that is our default. That's what we do. We wanna get control, we tighten the reins. What this leads to is this sense of constraint. It is maybe on our lifestyle, it might be on our time, uh, definitely on our needs and our wants, but there's this constraint. And constraint leads to obsessive thoughts. And whether that's uh, obsessive food thoughts, it might be just, I want that thing. It could be, but it just becomes our whole world. It's all that we focus on. We're thinking about our next meal, what we're not allowed to eat, what we can eat. Um, all these things just start to become all that we can think about. And at some point, boom, combustion happens, it gets broken, and we eat all of the things. And that completes the cycle, and it's another failure, and our self-esteem takes another hit. And at some point we rally again because the sense of control happens and around and around that we go. It's kind of like if you've ever squished yourself into pants that are too small. Uh, bra is an excellent example that I think most women can relate to. For you men, it could be belts too tight. Whatever it may be, whatever it is that's causing this restriction and constriction, it starts to become the only thing we can think about. And the longer the time goes that we've been feeling this constriction, the stronger the thoughts get, the more mental energy is placed on this restriction. It starts to be very distracting. And then the pleasure and the oh, sheer relief that comes from taking it off is just glorious. And then that glorious experience starts to fade until we try and squish ourselves into it one more time. And we just keep doing this over and over and over again. In fact, 40% of people 
who put themselves on any kind of plan of eating don't make it through the first week. That was uh, a UK study. Um, I'll have to find the reference, but that uh, that was astonishing to me. Don't not even a whole week, and another twenty percent don't make it the month, and uh, so it's it's not just you. <laughs> the other really interesting things: uh, animal studies. We really are interested in this food addiction stuff, but what's fascinating when we look at the animal studies is the way to get the animals to overeat is to first restrict. And that could be that it's restriction in terms of starvation, or it could just be certain amounts, or it could just be they only get access to food for a certain amount of time during the day, but they are restricted access to their food. And that is what will trigger the addictive like behaviors, the hoarding, the um, sense of urgency, what we know across the board restriction leads to overeating. The research on this is really fairly consistent and steady. But if we're not going to restrict, what are we going to do? Because that's what everyone teaches us to do, right, is to restrict. We might call it moderation, we might call it clean eating, we might call it portion control. Whatever it is though, restriction is the basis of it. So if we're not going to do that, what are we going to do? Well, there's three distinctive pieces to this. The first is halting the hangry. <laughs> Getting over hungry is a place that just leads to all kinds of stuff that's not going to feel good. Making peace with food is another big one and a very misunderstood concept. And measuring what matters. So these are the three cornerstones to adopting a new cycle. This is the intuitive eating hunger discovery scale. And really it's about learning what staying in the green zone feels like. Instead of pushing hunger into the red zone, we're gonna learn what it feels like and how to honor and respect subtle forms of hunger. Because when we let our hunger get to red, we're gonna eat to red out the other side. The making peace with food, it's, uh, it's sort of simplified and I'm going to say oversimplified to this concept that you're just going to eat what you want when you want. And I guess at its basic face value, that is exactly what it is. There's so much nuance to making peace with food though. And ultimately making peace with food is about establishing trust with yourself and food. It's like those lab rats. If we restrict their food, we have to let them have access for a while so they start to actually trust that the food is going to be there when they need it. And that is what brings them back to the place of normal eating, and that green eating where they're not, uh, they're not overfilling themselves. So making peace with food is a big important step. Measuring what matters. You know, we can say it's about health, we can say it's about all kinds of things, but if the scale or the measurements or the body fat percentage, if it is your appearance in any way that is what you are measuring and that is what's tracking whether or not something is working, that is wholeheartedly based in diet culture. Health is measured by so many things and there are so many more there's depth to this. So it's understanding what is motivating that sense of control. What are those underlying actual yearning desires and measuring the progress of those things. So if you'd like to hear more about these steps, I will definitely record a video on each of those. And if you would like to make sure that you don't miss it, this is how you can find me on my socials. And I look forward to talking to you again soon.